In the previous video, I talked about the importance of business research for business. Let's now take a look at why we should understand a bit about the research methods that underlie business research. Why can't we just read a study, read the introduction and read the conclusions and leave the methods to specialists? Unfortunately, specialists don't always get the methods correct. So you will need to be able to understand a bit about the logic, how we can use data to support arguments, to understand if those arguments are actually supported or not. There is quite a lot of shoddy research out there and you need to be able to understand what is high quality, what is justified and what is just uh, something that looks impressive but doesn't stand to closer scrutiny. The book talks about the importance of studying research from pretty much a single angle only. And this angle is that you need to learn methods to write your master's thesis. So you need to understand a bit about basics of methods to be able to write the methodology section of your thesis and also to actually do the empirical study. But there are other uses of research methods understanding as well. The second one is understanding and reading research articles. So when you're consuming research evidence, there are two reasons why you should understand a bit about methods. The first one, as I mentioned, is that you need to be able to evaluate if a study is actually done well and the results are trustworthy. So how can you actually trust that the conclusions follow from the data? How can you understand if an effect is large enough to care about? The second reason why understanding methods is useful is that it makes reading studies much more interesting. So if you're reading a study that is, let's say, 20 pages long, and then 10 pages of those is the methods and results section, you get a lot more out of the study if you understand what is going on in those more technical sections. They, they, if you understand a few basic principles, then the articles open up for you uh, a lot more than they otherwise would. Then uh, the third reason, even if you are never going to use research methods yourself after your master's thesis is that many people who go to business actually commission research studies. So you might, might commission a market study or you might commission an employee satisfaction survey. Understanding and evaluating if someone is giving you a good study and being able to uh, specify what a good study looks like is an important business skill. So a lot of Decisions in companies are made using different kinds of data and understanding a bit about how those data can be collected and analyzed, even if you're not collecting and analyzing them yourself, will make you a better manager. Let's take a look at a couple of uh, research studies that are a bit controversial. So the first one is something that many students have seen. So this is Amy Cuddy and her TED talk. Uh, last time I checked, this was the most viewed TED talk ever. And what Cuddy, she's a Harvard professor in organizational behavior. What she's explaining here is that we can improve human performance in various domains by using what she calls power posing. So the idea is that before a stressful situation, you take this kind of a powerful pose, you hold it for two or three minutes, and then uh, that will give you confidence you'll perform better in the task. Then she also measured some physiological responses in experimental settings. This study does not replicate. So she got results, but many others who replicated her study didn't get the same result. The study has been also criticized quite a lot and it's been used in books as an example of a study that is pretty shoddy. So we can't really trust the conclusions. I look at, at one specific aspect of the study. So she's doing experiments and in the experiment, uh, you randomize your subjects into treatment and control. The treatment group does the treatment and then the control group does something else. For example, in medical research, the treatment gets the medicine and the control gets the placebo and then you measure some kind of outcome. In this study published in Journal of Applied Psychology, which is the leading journal in organizational behavior, uh, she did a study where she used students and the students were tasked to prepare a speech for uh, a job interview. And they were videotaped 
and then someone rated those talks without knowing which condition the students were assigned to. The conditions were power posing, where the power posing group took this powerful pose, and then the other group took this low power pose. So they were preparing their job talks, standing legs crossed like that, and looking down. The power posing group did better in their job talks. So imagine that you have to uh, prepare a speech standing like that. If there is a difference between the power posing group and then the low power, power group, is it because the power posing actually helps or is it because this is actually a very awkward position to hold and you have to keep balancing yourself while you think about the talk that you are about to give in a few minutes. This is called the poison versus cure problem in experimental research. So sometimes it's not that our treatment, in this case power posing, helps, but it is um, just that the control condition, in this case the low power pose, actually harms your performance. If you compare any food against something really unhealthy food, then that any normal food is going to be superfood. But the for, so the comparison has to be fair. And in this case, it maybe wasn't. There are other uh, questionable aspects in this study as well that I will not go in detail in this video. A second example comes from uh, 2003. There was this study in Helsinki Sanomat, the leading Finnish newspaper, saying that one uh, visit to museum is worth 864 euros. So people who went to museums thought that they got 864 euros value out of that visit. And then uh, the people who read this study started doing all kinds of return on investment calculations. Like if uh, going to a museum costs you uh, 30 euros, then it pays back the money 30 times. Is it credible and how was it calculated? I don't think that going to a museum is worth 864 euros for an average person. But I can't just say that I don't buy the claim, because as a researcher I need to support my claims with data and I can't just dismiss somebody else's claim without looking at what the claim is based on. So to, to dismiss this study or to criticize it, we have to actually look at how the 864 here was calculated. There is the same uh, report in English, so this explains the, uh, the calculations. And then there is also uh, a journal article published explaining the method. So we have a prestigious professor saying that going to a Finnish museum uh, gives you welfare benefits for 864 euros. How do we evaluate whether that claim is actually reasonable or not? Well, we look at the methods part of the study. And this study is not well reported, so it's not fully transparent how exactly they calculated, but the report gives some ideas. So one thing that they did is that they asked their museum goers to rate their benefits on 16 different domains or 16 different sliders that were aggregating into, into four different domains. And for each of these 16 questions, you were asked to, to show or indicate how much value you got in that domain with a slider from 0 to 100 euros. So if you are, if you think that you got some value from going to museum, you don't want to ask where 0. But it's a slider and it's very difficult to give precise answers with the slider. So you might move the slider right a bit and then uh, it ends up being 100 euros. You might adjust it and it might end up 50 euros or 30 euros saying that a museum visit is worth two euros for you would be impossible with this kind of survey instrument. So we need to understand how the question was asked and if there is a source for bias. Also, why is it anchored to 1000 euros? Why not 100 euros? So if you put the, the slider from zero to 100, you're going to get very different kinds of responses just because the response format is different. Also, how they calculated the, um, the total value is that they took 
four dimensions, so they, they aggregated it to sum of sliders that consisted of one dimension, and there are four of these dimensions, and then you take a sum. So if you have basically four sliders from 0 to 100, uh, 1000, and you take a sum, you'll get a pretty large number. There were other questionable aspects to this study as well, but given the reporting is not as detailed as I would like it to be, it's uh, not something that I'm going to analyze here in more detail. So going back to where I started, understanding methods is important for three reasons. One, you need to understand a bit about methods to be able to complete your master's thesis. So you're going to face methods whether you want it or not if you want to graduate. The second one and a better reason to understand methods is that we need to be able to be critical about the studies that we read. So sometimes a person who presents your study might have an agenda. Like this study about museums was commissioned by a museum. Of course, they want to have a person who really is for museums. And even if a person doesn't want to deceive, for the lack of a better word, you, we have all our biases. So I, I like certain things, I want to present them in a better light. And that biases my judgments on, on what to do. It also biases what I want to publish. Then uh, the second reason is that if you, want, if you read a study and you actually understand what's going on in the methods, it's much more fun to read the studies. Otherwise, it's going to be very boring. And the final is that these same methods are being used in business life. For example, if you want to do A-B testing at work for testing different product features against others, you need to understand a bit about the experimental design to be effective. Even if you're not running the study yourself, you might be, uh, be required to comment a study done by somebody else.